Today, uh, scripture readings, the first one is from Hebrews 11, verses 32 through 34. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of the lions quench the fury of the flames and escape the edge of the sword whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Second reading is from Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. This is the gospel of the Lord. So we are um, continuing then on our journey, our epic road trip through Hebrews 11. And uh, where we are in Hebrews 11, if you want to just revisit that text in your trifold here, you can open up to Hebrews 11, 32 and 34. Uh, The writer of the Hebrews says, uh, what... Uh, more shall I say, I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah. Those are the, we did Gideon last week and we're doing the next three guys today. I think it's funny how he says, I don't have time to talk about these guys, um, but we're going we're gonna to take the time here this morning and talk about them. And they're guys that you don't probably hear a lot about typically. Uh, the next three guys on the list are Barak, Samson, and Jephthah. Um, Many of you probably don't know their stories. I think they're, they're kind of an odd inclusion on this list. Uh, you know, um, if you're talking about a list of heroes of the faith, they probably wouldn't make my top 100. Uh, there, there's some, some uh, uh, strange parts to their story as we walk through. So, uh, you know, initially I thought, why did the writer of the Hebrews include these three guys? And I think that as we go through this, we're going to find something that we have in common with these guys, and we're going to realize then Uh, why they're on the list. At least that's my hope. So we're going to start with Brock, and I'll tell you a little bit about his story. Uh, These three guys, their stories are all in the book of Judges. They were actually all three installed as judges of Israel at one time or another, and Brock then uh, served uh, with Deborah, who was a judge at the time, and she actually came to him and said, we need your help to lead the troops of Israel against our enemy, and God has promised victory. So uh, this is in Judges chapter 4, verse 6. Deborah sent for Barak and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go and take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them up to Mount Tabor. And I will lead the enemy's army, he goes on to describe their chariots and their, uh, all that they have, uh, to the river and give them over into your hands. And Barak said to her, uh, so first of all, let me back up just a little bit. Two weeks ago, we talked about what makes a good leader, right? And also what makes a good follower. And, and the formula that we sort of saw in Scripture play out over and over again is first to hear the voice of God, right? And then to believe the promises of God, and then finally to act on them. Everybody remember that? Hear the voice of God, to believe the promises of God, and then to act on them. So if uh, Barak was to do this, he's heard the voice of God through Deborah. She was not only a judge, but also a prophetess, and she's giving him the word of God. So he's listening to God's voice. If he were to believe God's promise, their promise was of victory, 
And he, if he were to act on them, then he would go out boldly trusting in those promises. But that's not what he did, in fact. If you look at the, the next verse in the text, Barak responded to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. So he's basically saying this equation of listening to God's voice, trusting God's promises, and, and then acting on it is not enough. You've got to add something to that in order for him to have the confidence to go into battle. And what he wanted to add to that was Deborah's presence. Deborah's presence. So she said, fine, I'll go with you. Um, and they went, and, and God delivered uh, their enemy into their hands. But, um, you know, for, for Barak, God wasn't enough. He needed to add something. So uh, one of my kids, I remember the, they had the first day of school, and they were, um, they were afraid. It was at a new school, and they were, they were pretty little, and uh, they just were uh, anxious and, and worried and fearful. And um, I remember then uh, they wanted to have courage, and in order to get that courage, they asked if they could bring with them, I don't remember if it was a teddy bear or a blanket or something like that, but as long as they got to keep that teddy bear or blanket in their backpack during the day, that would give them the courage that they needed uh, to face whatever challenge presented itself at a new day of school. And it kinda, this kind of reminds me of Barack here, right? His, his safety blanket, his teddy bear was Deborah in this case, right? But really, all the safety blanket we need is our God, right? If he promises us something, then that is all the assurance that we need in order to act with courage. Although... Uh, we often need to or require something else. I know another time, uh, one of my kids was at school. Uh, my son, David. Say hi, David. Um, he, was, uh, he was in preschool, and there was a little girl there that was very upset about something. And in fact, we had just had a conversation on the way to school where David asked me the question, uh, how does Jesus protect us and watch over us if we can't see him? That was the question that he asked. Even as a preschooler, he's thinking about God and asking questions. And I said, well, um, even though you can't see it, you know, we're, we're in God's hands and he, he will watch over us and bring about uh, only good things for us. And I said, that doesn't mean that we won't have difficult times. It doesn't mean we won't be sad. It doesn't mean we won't get hurt sometimes. What it does mean is that God is always there with us and we will be with him forever. And his response was, so it's kind of like a force field. That was, that was how it made sense to him. A force field. And I said, I said sure, yeah, it's a Jesus force field. And uh, so that day then, that exact same day, he was, he was there uh, in his class with another little girl who was upset about something. I don't know what it was about. And um, she was crying and so on. And, and, and David went up to her and he said, get really close to me because I am protected by Jesus' force field. <laughs> and if you're next to me, then we'll both be protected. And uh, I thought that what a great picture of faith um, that uh, he, you know, even more faith than Barak had uh, to believe that God is all you need, right, to protect you and watch over you, and that you can share that with others, that we can, we can uh, with our proximity, get close to others so that we can then give them those promises of assurance that they can also hear God's voice, believe God's promises, and act on them. And the biggest promise, of course, that we have is that because of Christ, we will be with Jesus forever. That's the victory that God gives us. And that's the promise that we're called on to, to believe and act on. So, um, you know, one thing I want to uh, just bring up, I think that uh, as adults, what we most often uh, want as our safety blanket, the most often the thing that we add to this equation is money. At least for me, it's a lot easier to step out in faith and meet challenges if you have financial resources to do it, right? Um, and that can be a temptation, then as long as I have money, then I can do what God wants me to do. In fact, our church struggled with that recently. I'll share that story just a bit. Um, we were, there's a very generous woman in our congregation that uh, we had a $2 million endowment that she gave as part of her estate. And we went through a building project where we built our early childhood center, the, the newer building over there that our kingdom kids are in. And we got a loan for it. 
and we wanted to keep that $2 million in our endowment fund, and we were going to pay uh, just payments on this loan to pay for the building. And um, somebody then said, why, why are we doing this? Why are we taking out a loan when we have the money in the bank? God has given us this gift uh, for this need. Why don't we use it? And I remember struggling with that. It was, it's easier to do ministry with $2 million in the bank. It just is. You don't have to trust in God as much. You just don't. And so we struggled with this, and it was because that paying off that loan required more faith and trust in God to provide in the future that I finally landed on. Yeah, that's something that we need to do because trusting in God for him to provide is a good thing. Trusting in that money in the bank, not a good thing. So, uh, and I think we, that, that's our orientation a lot as adults, and we have to recognize that, um, that God is the only thing that we need. There's no, nothing to add to that equation in order to believe his promises and, and act on them. So that's what we're called to do. Hear his voice, believe his promise, and act on them. So that's Barak. Um, Samson, then, is the next guy on our list, and God used him for two important purposes uh, Samson, first of all, uh, was born with great strength for the purpose of defeating the Philistines who were oppressing Israel at the time. And uh, also, God gave him a Philistine wife uh, because God wanted to confront them and he needed a reason to do it. So this is the reason that, that he gave. So, so Samson was to uh, accomplish both of these things. The voice of God then came to Samson's mom uh, with th this promise in Judges 13.5. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite dedicated to the God from the womb, and he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So there's God's voice coming to him. There's God's promise. He's called to believe that promise and to act on it, not to add anything else to the equation. But if you know the story of Samson, what he adds to the equation is chasing after women, and it gets him in trouble. In the end, uh, he chases after a girl who's only out to, to hurt him. In fact, he knows it, and he keeps giving her false information so that they can't uh, gain victory over him. And finally, she breaks him down, and he tells her that he can't have his hair cut. And then when they cut the hair, he's defeated. And so this thing that he adds to the equation is, God isn't enough. His purpose isn't enough for me. I have to add to that, uh, you know, chasing after these, these girls. Um, you know, uh, I remember a story a long time ago where uh, one of my relatives was telling me a story about their 10-year-old son, and uh, the 10-year-old son asked his mom for a poster of Wonder Woman, and she thought, uh, well, that's good, the, to have a female role model hero, and that's what he wants, I'm going to honor that and get him a, a poster of Wonder Woman, he's a 10-year-old boy, and uh, he says when she buys it for him, she sa he says, no, no, I want the one with the line on her chest, probably talking about cleavage, she thought. And um, so it's, it's from, from a very young, uh, you know, point of view, it's sort of hardwired in, in our brains to, to want these things. And, um, you know, some guys never grow out of chasing after that line on the chest, right? And, and they fall into the same trap that Samson did. So here's, uh, here's a challenge that I have for I don't know what line women look for. Maybe abs, the six-pack. Is that what line? They, um, but whatever it is, uh, whatever it is, uh, I'm going to issue a challenge, especially to the men out there. Um, and that is, if you see a woman that comes into a, whatever room that you're in that's dressed to impress, instead of looking at her, watch the other men in the room. <laughs> it's embarrassing because they will all be watching her. And then you get a picture of what you look like when you do that, and you're going to think, I, I don't, never want to look like that again, because that's how women see us when we're looking at the woman in the room who's dressed to impress. So, um, and it's a good gut check as to, as to where our, our heart is, right? And, and, and when it comes to lust, it's not just women or men that we can lust after. It's everything that we don't have. We can lust after cars that we, ha we don't have, after houses, after boats, whatever it is that you look at with envy and say, God hasn't given me that, but I want it anyway. That is the same trap, the same trap that Samson fell into. So the, the issue here is contentment. 
It's, it's to want God above every other thing. It's to want him more than anything else and to be content with what he has then given us as his precious gift and his precious grace. That he, it is his pleasure to give the kingdom to his children, and if we take stock of what he, we have been given and give thanks for it, that keeps our hearts then in check. And so Samson's trap was then he added something to that equation. He couldn't be content with what God uh, had given him. So um, contentment over lust is, is the lesson, I think, from Samson. Uh, and then finally we have Jephthah. Um, I was telling Casey earlier in the week that I was not looking forward to talking about Jephthah. I don't know if you know about this story, but it's, it's one that I frankly wish wasn't in the Bible. It's hard to deal with. And uh, I'll share with you the story. Um, so this is when God's voice came to Jephthah, Judges eleven twenty nine. 29. Then the Spirit of the Lord came to Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh and passed through Gilead. And from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites, I will give, I will, uh, will be the Lord's and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Okay? You probably can know where this is headed. Uh, his only daughter came out of the door. And this was the vow that he made. So it wasn't enough for him that God had promised him victory. He had to add something to the equation. He thought additional sacrifice was needed. After God had already promised something, he thought additional sacrifice was needed. Now, I'll tell you the rest of the story. This is why I wish it wasn't in the Bible, because he comes home, and he's just overcome with guilt and remorse because his daughter is the first thing that comes out of his house, and he tells her this vow that he made, and she actually encourages him to fulfill his vow to the Lord. Now, let me say uh, just real quick that this was not a God-pleasing sacrifice, nor was it a God-pleasing vow. And the reason why he made this is because the uh, pagan religions of this time had so permeated uh, the Israelite culture that he actually thought that offering his daughter as a sacrifice was going to be a God-pleasing thing. And it just is evidence of the fact that they had strayed so far that, that he thought this would be a good thing. He thought that God's promise wasn't enough, that additional sacrifice was needed. And it was not a God-pleasing sacrifice. It was actually evidence that he was uh, embedded in this um, Israelite culture that worshipped other gods. And so, well, how can we relate to Jephthah? What's the lesson that we can learn from him? Well, I think that we actually do this too in terms of not believing that God's promises are enough, that we want to add an additional sacrifice of our own. And um, what that looks like is, is we hear the promise of God in Jesus Christ, and we hear that, that his grace is a free gift that covers over our sins and removes them as far as the east is from the west, yet we still try to be worthy. We still strive to make our own sacrifices, to make up the gap, we think to ourselves, well, there's no way that Christ's sacrifice could be sufficient to cover over my sin, therefore I must do this or I must do that. Well, let me just put your mind at ease for a moment, okay? If you're, if you're trying to be worthy of the gift of Christ, you can rest assured that you will never be, nor will I. If worthiness is over here, we're as far that way as you can get. We can never, ever be worthy of the gift of Christ. There is no other sacrifice needed. We are called upon simply to live our lives in gratitude and thanksgiving for what God has given us in Jesus Christ. So stop offering extra sacrifice. Here's another thing we do. We think that beating ourselves up over our sin somehow makes us worthy of God's gift, and it doesn't. In fact, that's not what he wants for you. He wants you to have your sin removed as far as the east is, is from the west. God has forgotten it, and he calls on us to get past it too. The, the emotion that he wants for us is joy. Now, so that I think is a good lesson uh, for, for Jephthah. And um, I just want to say too that uh, as we listen to the promises of God um, and then hear his voice and then believe those promises, and uh, act on them, um, I think that what we also need to look at is the way that 
uh, the sin in the lives of these three guys, guys really caused them a lot of heartache and hurt and also uh, a lot of heartache and hurt for others in their lives as well, right? And I think that we, we think that uh, God, as he, as he gives us his commands, is just kind of this overbearing father that just has a list of rules that we need to follow, when in fact those, those rules are given out of love because he doesn't want us to endure the pain and hurt that goes along with disobedience, right? He's trying to spare us from that. If he wants only good things for us, the best thing for us is just to be close to him. The best thing for us is just to hear and walk with him in obedience. So that's what he is, is calling us to do. But in the midst of that, he still grants the victory that he has promised in his word. And that's, you know, all three of these guys fall into the category of imperfect warriors whom God granted victory. And that's all of us, right? We're imperfect warriors whom God has granted victory. And the victory that he grants, once again, is being in his presence for eternity. Notice that what he doesn't promise any of these three guys is that they won't get hurt. Uh, he doesn't promise any of these three guys that it won't require sacrifice. It doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't say to any of these three guys that it's going to be easy. And I think that we can relate to that, too, as we walk through life and we, we have struggle we have a challenge in our lives, um, and we just have to believe that in God's promise, he's gone before us, the text says, and he has already provided us with victory, which gives us the confidence and the courage to tackle any challenge, any challenge in our midst. So, um, you know, God doesn't lead us into battle without protection from the enemy. God doesn't lead us into battle without protection from the enemy. And that's why I want to go quickly to Ephesians 6 and talk about the full armor of God. That chapter starts off with uh, Paul uh, urging us to put on the full armor of God. Now, these three guys only put on part of the armor of God. If you look in Ephesians, or I'm sorry, in uh, Hebrews 11, it says that what they had was God's promise, right? They had, had the voice of God, which Ephesians says is the sword of the Spirit. And they had the uh, shield of faith. That's why they're in Hebrews 11, is because they, they acted in faith according to God's promise. But they lacked the full armor of God. And um, let me just uh, share with you for Barak, for instance. He could have used the feet fitted with readiness that it says in Ephesians 6 to put on. The feet fitted with readiness. He wasn't ready. When God called him to battle, to... Uh, to hear his promise and act on it, he wasn't ready. In fact, he said, I'm, I'm going to require something else in Deborah to come with me. So my prayer for us is that we have on the feet of readiness so that when we hear the call of God, we can act with courage and with conviction. So the feet of readiness. And then Samson, of course, um, he didn't have on his breastplate of righteousness, right? The breastplate of righteousness is that obedience. First, that we put on the breastplate of righteousness of Christ that is far better than ours. But so often we take it off for the sake of sin, doing something that's not obedient to God. And when we do that, we leave ourselves open for attack. We leave ourselves open for hurt and heartache. So my prayer for us is then that we put on the breastplate of righteousness of Christ and don't take it off for the sake of sin, but leave it on for the sake of obedience. And then finally, Jephthah could have used the helmet of salvation. He thought that additional sacrifice was necessary. You see, even in the Old Testament times, when there was sacrifice required, it was only to point to the ultimate sacrifice that covered over all sin. There's only one sacrifice that actually was efficient for covering over sin, and that was Christ. All others just point to Christ. And so that's the helmet of salvation that we receive, that Christ has done all that's necessary for us. And so that is my prayer for us also, that we would put on that helmet of salvation as a gift from Jesus Christ. And so don't put on part of the armor of God, but listen to Paul when he says put on the full armor of God, and uh, that's what we are called to do as Christians for our own protection, for our own well-being, that we can then act on God's promise. So I'm going to pray for that uh, for us right now, that we put on together the full armor of God. Lord God, we thank you so much for uh, the example of these three guys in Scripture, that even though they were imperfect warriors, you granted them victory according to your promise. 
We pray that we too, as imperfect warriors, would hold on to your promise of victory, that we would continue to act and to step out in faith with courage to do the work that you have called us to do, to fight the battles that you have called us to fight. We ask that you would protect us in those battles with that full armor, the full armor of God, that we wouldn't just put on some of it, that we would put on all of it for the sake of of, uh, being close to you. And Lord God, we we ask first and foremost that, that our greatest desire would just to be in your presence. And we give you thanks that you have blessed us with this time together, Trinity and Avenue and Redemption, that we can uh, be about the work that you have given us in John 17, and that unity in your love proclaims to the world that you, in fact, were sent by God for the salvation of the world. We pray that our words and actions would reflect that, that others would come to know you. And we ask for your blessings on uh, just a hurting and broken world in which we live, that in the midst of violence and division and strife, that your word would permeate that division and violence to bring about peace that only the gospel has, the peace that only knowing you has, Lord. And all we want is for us and for our churches to be your instruments of that peace. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to to stand together as, uh, as we pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us. And as his disciples asked, Lord, when we pray, how should we pray? And he gave them the, this, this wonderful and eloquent prayer. And uh, so we at Trinity make it a priority to pray this together every Sunday. So I invite you to join with us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You can have a seat. I'm going to invite my good friend and brother Casey up. That's how God has worked in his life. Thank you, Pastor Vince. Man, you can preach all the time. Does he not do a great job? I love that. I think you're an amazing preacher. I just love that you guys have such a rich Lutheran heritage, that you're committed to it, and um, that you have walked so faithfully in that. And I love sitting under your teaching. So thank you so much for who you are and who your church is. That goes for all Trinity. We love you, and we love getting to do this together. So... Continuing from the passage that Pastor Vince brought to us, verse 33, who through faith conquered kingdoms, nope, enforced justice, not really, obtained promises, sort of, stopped the mouths of lions, definitely not. Quenched the power of fire? No. Escaped the edge of the sword? Nope. Were made strong out of weakness? Yes. I made the list. I was going through that list. I'm like, nope. Have not stopped the mouth of lions. Don't even like cats. Never been near a sword unless it was like on display. Um, Never really been in any kind of battle that I know of. And so I'm thinking, I'm going to give my story in light of these three guys and then all the things that precede their life. I can't relate to any of them except this kingdom principle of it's the weak that get made strong. Uh, I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't have a ton of time to unpack that for you, but that's one of the kingdom principles I don't like. If it were up to me, it would read, um, as the strong get stronger. And I would be doing everything to be strong because I hate being weak. I hate feeling weak. I hate feeling the way that I feel oftentimes and then stepping into environments where strength is expected. 
I'm not sure the church has always done a great job of living this principle out or celebrating this principle. The church, and I don't mean these churches, but I mean historically, sometimes the church has been known for shooting the weak, exposing the weak, and not allowing the weak to have a place to thrive and taste the grace of God. And so sometimes I believe that lie. And it becomes very unsettling to me when I find myself in a spot with people looking at me, thinking we need to go to the left or to the right or you're going to give a word from the Lord. And I just feel so weak. Um, if you don't know my story, I think maybe at this point my three-year-old daughter might, might help us out here. Uh, take a look at her. You, you saw her in one of the announcements. I think we have a picture. That's her right there violently shooting somebody else in the back of the head, okay? So thanks, for Haynes, around here. Some Haynes, I can see your influence on her already. Yes. One of the things I love about my daughter, Cora is her name, is that she has a very strong vocabulary except for a few words. And there's one word that she just cannot get, and the word is nothing. So if you were to ever get around my daughter and somehow get her to say the word nothing, it would come out nothing. And she's got a little sass to it too. So if you, if you want some of her Cheetos, and she might, she might say, I got nothing for you. You know, that, that, that's just kind of her, her vibe. She got nothing. Nothing, nothing for you. 2011, a pastor by the name of Tully and Tavisian came out with a book that I think is very appropriate for my story. And the title of the book was A Simple Equation, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. The problem is, Cora's daddy has a real hard time living out nothing. Thirteen years old, I came to understand that I was in sinner, in need of grace, and that I had no hope outside of what Jesus Christ had accomplished for me by being penalized for my sin, dying my death, and being raised to life on the third day. As a 13-year-old, I turned from myself, I turned from, from my life over here, and I just said, Jesus, you're it, you're my only hope. I'm, I'm trusting you as best I can. And, and on that day, the Lord gave me a new heart. He put his spirit to live within me, he forgave me of all my sins, and I began to walk a new life. But one of the things that I can relate to as I thought, how timely is it, Lord, that I'm going to give my testimony behind these three men is that although he forgave me and adopted me and cleansed me, there was still a lot of work to be done on the idols of my heart. And I was experiencing forgiveness, but I wasn't walking in the fullness of freedom. And mine is the testimony that's actually still unfolding. Mine is not a testimony of this is how it used to be, Woo, glad I'm not that guy anymore. This is how it is, all idol-free, look at me. Mine is the story of the UFC fight that happened last night. If you're familiar with that world, just imagine two guys battling it out. That's what happens inside of me every single day between Jesus plus nothing and Jesus plus proving myself. There's four gospel principles that I want to leave you with today in our time remaining and they come from Tim Chester. They're called the four G's. They're pretty big around the Avenue Church. You may have heard them, and uh, this has uh, really defined my life and the beginning of me starting to walk in some freedom over that idol of religiosity and proving myself. Because there's something you might not know about me if you've been here not a very long time, but that I, every day, including this morning and including the moments preceding this particular moment, walk in a constant battle of anxiousness. It's not worry like you might think normal people worry. Budgets, is my daughter going to drive home safe? It's, that's, not, that's not my reality. My reality is a heart-pounding, mind-clinching desire to be away from all of you so that I can work this out in my head and somehow save myself reality. And it in a way, 
oftentimes finds me sacrificing my daughter and time being present with her. It finds me following after the, the next worry thought. I mean, it, it can be really crippling when I walk under the power of an anxious heart. And I've realized it's not a behavioral issue. It's not a quit worrying issue. It's a believing issue. And this is where we'll end. God is great in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I don't need to be in control. That's truth number one. God is good in Jesus Christ. Therefore, I don't need to look elsewhere. That's truth number two. God is gracious. Therefore, I don't need to fear you. That's truth number three. But truth number four is, I believe, what drives much of my anxiousness and where God has brought much freedom. God is gracious. Therefore, I don't need to prove myself to you, to me, or to him. I'm going to ask the team to come, and we're going to prepare for uh, our final song, and we're going to prepare for a response. The truth of the gospel is actually not enough. The truth of these four G's and knowing them at a head level is not enough because I know them at a head level. I am deeply convicted of their truth, and yet oftentimes I can still find myself walking in what can be debilitating anxiousness. Here is what is missing from me and what might be missing from you. Repentance and faith. It's one thing to know that God is gracious, therefore I don't need to prove myself. It's another thing to actually turn from my sin and begin to walk in the faith of that. And what God has been showing me in my particular story is that I am a dealer in hope. I love being a peddler of grace. Like I am the first on the scene for grace to anyone in here. And yet very slow to my own heart. And this is what he's been showing me. Casey, you would never want your little core of joy to be constantly maintaining, protecting, and keeping your relationship alive with her. You would never want her to always be in flight or fight mode because she was afraid that she had to continue to earn your favor, would she? Would you? Would you want her to come home and constantly be performing and looking and saying, are we okay? Are we good? Are we good? I had that conversation. Are we good? I had that look. Are we good? I did that. Are, are, you, are you okay with me, Daddy? Can I rest, Daddy? Can I just be in your presence as I am, Daddy? Are you enough for me, or do I have to keep adding to this equation? I would never wish that on Cora. And so... God has allowed me to begin to walk in that same repentance for myself, saying, God, I'm sorry, not for my worry, but I'm sorry for my unbelief that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Will you forgive me? Will you heal me? And will you give me faith to believe that Christ and Christ alone is all I need? As we close here in song, the song is actually going to reflect this idea of give me faith. And so I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward. And the Lord may have spoken something to you as Pastor Vince was sharing about those, those areas that we explored in the narrative from Hebrews 11, from the book of Judges. Maybe he's spoken something to you about your own repentance and what it means to quit trying so hard and start coming to Jesus for faith and allowing the gospel to change you rather than your own failing efforts. If you'd like prayer over that, we'd love to offer that to you. We'd love to have a moment and just lay a hand on you and, and ask God's gracious spirit to come upon you and help you to believe maybe what you've never believed before. If you've never trusted Christ in a Christ and Christ alone manner, Man, this is your day because his mercies are new every day. And I would invite you to respond in prayer.
This is a moment that will be filled with song. Our offering table will be open back there. There's a place for Avenue. There's a place for uh, Trinity Lutheran. You can also give online, those of you who are watching, all sorts of opportunities for you to do that and engage. We would ask that you respond how the Lord leads. And Daniel dismisses. Father, help us and fill us with your spirit in this moment. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.